So, shalom, good evening. First of all, the title of tonight's talk is so long that it includes so many things in it. It's almost like, um, did you see the title? <laughs> the, the fall and rise. First of all, whoever talks about the fall and rise of something, you just look at the rise and fall. This is the fall and rise of space, time, and consciousness. What are he possibly talking about? A short overview, a short overview of the spiritual history of the world. Can you imagine? <laughs> Including visions of the future. <laughs> and I actually gave him this, but I said, can we change it? He says, no, I already printed it. <laughs> okay, in order to get really uh, spiritually ready to do such a thing, and we can tackle it, Consider tonight a night at the movies. You're going to get some ancient movies. And it might not be what you might call a practical class we're in tonight. But it's going to change the way you look at your own lives and at the world. It changed me. But in order to prepare, I would like to sing a song with you. I gave out a number of songbooks, actually every one that I have left, and so I want to ask you to open up to page 7 at the bottom. Whoever doesn't have one, please share with your neighbor. There should be enough, for, at least for every one or two people, no, I mean every two or three people. This, these songs are in this book are quite amazing, it took me a number of years to gather them. The songs that our people sing are awesome songs, are uplifting songs. <coughs> this song here, which I already shared with our friends in Boulder on Thursday night, is a song from, the, from 1482. The words are from 1482 during the Spanish Inquisition. They were found in a manuscript in Portugal at that time. The tune is from Baghdad, but it, sometimes it sounds more like Pete Seeger because I slow it down. <laughs> the bottom of page seven. Sing along if you feel comfortable doing so. It goes then over onto page eight, which is of course in an English style. It goes not as a Hebrew book, but as an English book. Elohe o. is so special. It's, a, it's written on one level about the author's writing about how he became fatally ill to the point in the fourth stanza where his fever is so high that it's almost it. He's almost passing over. But then he comes back and he's thankful and he wants to thank God in public also. He wants to say the Gomel prayer in shul. He's in Spain though and already there's a hiding going on. 
The Jews have to hide. It's the crypto Jews. I used to call them Moranos, but the Moranos themselves don't want to be called that anymore. There are thousands of people in Mexico, New Mexico, South America, who are discovering that they really are Jewish. And it's a whole movement now. There's a whole movement that these people are considered, after 500 years, they maintain their genealogical purity. So the crypto Jews, the hidden Jews of Spain, they wrote this song about what they were going through. Again, on one level, a man who was sick, and he was in a fever, and he prays and he thanks God for giving him the life, his life back. On a second level, Am Yisrael, the Jewish people in exile. We get to the point of feverish. We lose our identity. We don't know who we are anymore. And we come back with total thankfulness. And then we get back even a higher level of consciousness of God than if we had never left before. And specifically in Portugal, the Jews in, in Portugal and Spain being burned at the stake, being burned at the stake, the fourth, the fourth stanza, the fire within me, it's burning me. A hidden hint, an allusion to the fact that our people are being burned, that we were dying for our beliefs. The third stanza. Yeshua Tra Devoini Veagla at the bottom of the page. There's a whole essay about it in one of my books. 
It's really also about the soul. We come into this world. We come into this world and we lose it. What's this world all about? How many of you find it difficult to believe that you have a neshama, a soul? Anybody here? Yeah, it's hard. But would you be willing to hear more about what the neshama is? And then maybe you'd have a little bit better <laughs> way of deciding if you have one or not. <laughs> the soul comes down into this world, just like similar in the, in, the, in the matrix, in the movie. They're able to go down into the matrix. And everybody there is asleep. They don't know it. And it's really an incredible metaphor for what this world is about. So let's talk a little bit about it. Let's go back and um, let me show you something. The Sefer Yitzira talks about what I call the three coordinates. It's who you are, where you are, and when you are. Right? Space, time, and consciousness. Here's um, who you are, here's when you are, and here's where you are. A very interesting paradigm of the, of, the, of, the, of the confluence of these three coordinates is the Kohen Gadol, the high priest. On the holiest day of the year, the holiest person goes into the holiest place. He goes into the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur. Right? That's a confluence. And once you're aware of such a thing, of where you are and when you are, then the who you are becomes the determining factor of what can be done in any one place. When you're lighting candles for Shabbos, right? when you're saying something or doing something significant, you see, where am I in the larger picture? When is it? What day of the week is it? Is it significant? Or perhaps in order to find the significance in time, what period, what millennia are we in? What millennium are we in, vis-a-vis -vis the whole of history? I want to know about the larger pictures and come back into my particular life at this particular moment and bring the larger picture to bear on who I am right now. There is a larger picture. It's a little bit small for this crowd, but I mean for this room. But look at this as an incredible symmetry that's provided here that I'm going to try and provide you with, going back to the Torah's, the Bible's story, the biblical narrative of creation. It starts up at top. The sun is really just a symbol for the verse, the fourth verse in Genesis that says, God saw the light that it was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. The rabbis say, and the rabbis usually get a bad rap. Uh, I'm here to tell you that they're, um, they're there. They're connected. Much more than they've been given credit for. They hid their words. They hid what they were saying in order to protect it from those who would try and misuse it. They had very precious knowledge bestowed to them, bequeathed to them by the prophets and they were faithful carriers of this knowledge. Even, the, even, even willing to take a bad rap, but they, will, they needed to because they, they had to hide what they really wanted to say so that only those who would understand would understand. And this is a protection for the Jewish people as they wandered in exile throughout history, always at the mercy of one real ruler or empire or another. So the first day, is called the retrieving or the withdrawal of the light. God separated the light from the darkness. The rabbis say it was a withdrawal of the light. In the Sefer Bahir, one of the Kabbalistic classics discovered in the 1200s, but written 1,200 years before, it says that God withdraws six-sevenths of the light of his infiniteness and only created the world with one-seventh. 
That's indicated in the first day that God separated the light out. Another Midrash says that it was Shabbos before creation and the light was shining everywhere. The divine light was shining everywhere and God said this, I love this light, this is a good light. I want to give it, I want to give it to man. I want to create a world within which there will be a creature called man whom I, to whom I can give this light. In order to do so, I'll pull back the, the, the majority, the greater part of my light in order to create a world where my light is hidden and almost undetectable. And I'll do it in stages. That there'll be more light at first, but then less and less light until I get down to the sixth day. In order to give the chance for a human being to exist who can come to me on his own without being coerced. So the, the process begins here at day one, but it continues on in a very interesting way. And this is now a mixture of the written Torah with the oral Torah. The written Torah without the oral Torah cannot be understood. The oral Torah provides some very important keys. And we'll come back to the first day in a moment. The second day is when God separated the upper waters from the lower waters, or the lower waters from the, the upper waters. He told the lower waters, you've got to go down and make the seas on the planet Earth. It's a story. It's a children's level story. Within the children's level story, there's a deeper message. What is that deeper message? The Midrash says that in, in, in addition to the lower waters being separated from the upper waters, the angel of death was created on day number two. Dispute, which is called machloket in Hebrew. Dispute, dichotomy was created on day number two. Which, which really actually makes sense, because it's two. Um, The lower waters, the Midrash, said, the Midrash says, the lower waters complained and cried and said, why do we have to go down? And God said, well, you know what? In the reward of growing down, I'm going to make you higher than the higher waters when you come back up. This is similar to the difference between angels and human beings, human souls. Angels stayed upstairs and we decided and we chose to come down here. It's hard down here. It's harder down here, and therefore, when we will leave this place, or when this place will become elevated, we'll be higher than the angels. It requires more explanation, but for tonight, I'm going through it fairly fast, just to give you an overall idea, and we'll see if we can just see the pattern unfolding. I call it a pattern of mishaps. Something went wrong on every day of creation. That's the hidden, te that's the hidden key here. On the first day, the light, which was supposed to shine, God's light was supposed to shine into creation, and yet he hid most of it away for the future. The light of the Sabbath, the great light of the Sabbath, he says, I'm going to hold back until the seventh millennium, right? Until all, everything is all over. It's called, it was first in thought, but it'll only be last in deed. But it was first in thought. And that first thought is the whole guiding principle for everything that's going to happen for the 6,000 years of human history that starts with Adam. This is actually prehistory. This is equivalent to the modern theory of the Big Bang, where there are many supernova explosions along the way, where, where the stars coalesce and then blow apart again, and coalesce and blow apart in order to create the heavier elements which are going to provide the basis for an Earth, a planet Earth that can support human life. It has to take many stages. So this is the Midrashic equivalent. In Kabbalah it's called the shattering of the vessels. God brought his light into the vessels and they broke. And he brought his light again into the lower vessels and they broke. And into the vessels again and they broke. Again, three parallel things. The Midrashic here, where something wrong happens every day. The the physics, which is the supernova explosions that follow the, the Big Bang, which are the Little Bangs, in order to produce a situation where the sun will, will break off from its star, and then it will have parts break off from it, which are the planets around our solar system, and then off of us will break the moon, right? But in the process, it gets colder and cooler, and it, he's supportable of life. So it's a very parallel system, even though the rabbis didn't have the equipment they didn't have the technology that we have now, but they had the prophetic insight 
They had the tradition that was handed down to them, the prophetic tradition that was given to them in their deep meditative states. That the physical, the creation of the physical universe parallels that which even preceded the creation of the physical universe. These are stages in consciousness, according to the rabbis. This is not telling us about the first thousand years and the second thousand years. These are billions of years in human time, but they're called six days in God time. The third day, the trees. The trees said, according, again, according to the children's level, the trees said, God said, Etz pri, oset pri, that there should be an edible tree that produces fruit, fruit produces fruit. But in the end, it was only Etz oset pri. One word was left out, a tree that produces fruit. It was not an edible tree anymore. The Bidra says that the trees said, we don't want evil people to come eat us, and we won't be able to reproduce. We're going to cover ourselves with bark and our fruits with rind and shells to protect ourselves. One way of understanding it would be that the Torah itself is protected by shells, bitter shells, that when you bite into them, you might think, if this is all there is to it, who wants it? I'll spit this out. But that protects the inner fruit of the Torah for those who are serious, those who want it. As we learned over Shabbat, everything in the Torah, if you're sensitive, if you're there seeing through the spaces, it's inviting you in. It's telling you, there's more here. Come on in. Ask your questions, because on the surface, I'm making it, purposely making it, that it doesn't make sense. In order that you should ask and come in to what the real Torah is saying. That's called the concept of the shells. We're told in the future, which is the, which is the way up here, wherever you get all the way down and we go into history, which is the... The, the, the lines that go up and down where sometimes we come a little bit back up to, wow, this is, this is amazing, this world. It's so hidden. It's such a broken world. But there are people like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob who set the, the tone for the Jewish soul, and then they go down into Egypt, right? And then they come back up into the land of Israel with Joshua after coming to Sinai. And then they go down after having the first temple. They go into Babylon into exile. And we come up again to the second temple, right? The ups and downs of history. But it all makes more sense when you know what this is about. So we're promised that the light again will be revealed when we come full circle. We're promised that the lower waters will be lifted up higher than the upper waters when we come back. We're promised that the trees will taste like fruits. That the trees will be fruit producing in such an amazing way. This is the, called the messianic age, right? It's a dream. It's a vision. But we're told don't take it lightly. Everything will change. The world now is in a lower state. The Gan Eden, the Edenic state, is a higher energy state. Right? And even that, we're going to go up beyond that, to the level of the sun and beyond. But we had to come down from these upper levels where the light was totally shining. When the light is totally shining, you can't have a world. The light has to be withdrawn in order to give possibly existence to separate entities. That's God's gift. In a way, it sounds, it seems like from down here that, you know, well, what'd you do? You left us all alone. But from his point of view, from the godly point of view, the point of view of the infinite, this is a kindness because eventually it's going to bring all of us back into itself and we're going to be conscious. That's the gift of the infinite to us, is infinite existence, eternal existence, conscious. Because in the infinite, we were unconscious. In order to give us the gift of consciousness, the light is pulled back in successive stages. And each one is a different metaphor for the same idea. The light is being pulled back in stages in order to create a stage where man can have free will and even do that which is absolutely antithetical to godliness. But it's all part of the story. So when you have this larger picture, you see one of the reasons why a lot of questions cannot be answered is when you don't have the full picture it's like, you know, going up the mountain at different stages. You can see a part of the city now from this, side, from this height of the mountain. But when you go up even higher, you can see the relationship of this city to another city. You can see the plain in between. You can see the terrain. And you go up even higher, you can see the whole valley, right? So these are called paradigm shifts. You've got to have got up to the top in order to understand what's going down below. You can't do it within the system. 
The Torah provides a system that tells us what happens outside of the system. Mankind flounders when we don't have this. We don't have an objective morality. The Torah is extremely relevant to our days. It just has to be a little bit brought into our modern idiom, right? By those who are interested enough in giving, in giving the Torah a chance to speak. And it has a lot to say to us. Then back onto this, into this, and we'll, we'll finish with this and go to the next stage. The fourth day is a little bit more famous than the others. The fourth day is the famous argument between the sun and the moon. Really, it wasn't an argument at all. And really, it, wasn't, it was just a children's story, the way it's told. The moon complained to God and said, I don't want to share a crown with the sun. I want my own crown. So God said, remember what he said? Make yourself small. Go make yourself small. The Talmud says, God said, go make yourself small. Go diminish yourself. It sounds like, it's like, what do you, I said something good, the moon says. I said something good. Why am I being punished? It's not a punishment. It seems like a punishment. In one way, it seems like, go make yourself small is a punishment for speaking up. It may have to seem like that on the outside, but really what it is, is that the moon is being told, and the moon represents the female. The moon represents the soul. The moon represents many different things. I always bring in Cinderella and all these different sleeping beauty and amazing mythologies all over the world that have the same idea. Something has to go to sleep, and then something has to come and wake it up. It's the human soul, right? It becomes small when it comes down into this world. Anyway, the way the Talmud tells it is very interesting. All this, again, is an overview, and I'm not going to the details. But the idea here of the moon being made small and the sun being limited to its orb, because we say, that the rabbis say that before the fourth day of creation, whatever that was, it's not a regular day, before the fourth day of creation, the sun was not limited to its orb. It was ubiquitous. It was all over. Even though it was only one millionth of the original light, and we're already down here on the fourth day, but it was still pretty heavy when we're talking with such a powerful light. It's being lessened each time, but it's still very powerful. Now two things are happening. One is that the light of the sun is limited to the orb of the sun. In Hebrew it's called nartik shel chama, nartiko shel chama, the sheath, the sheath of the sun. Sometimes God takes the sun out of its sheath, like when Abraham was circumcised, right? And then he puts it back in. It gets very hot when he takes it out of its sheath. It's almost like like a big hole in the ozone, right? It's not only a sheath around the sun, it's a sheath around us. And that ozone protects us and allows life to exist on this planet. If the ozone would be damaged more than it is right now, then life couldn't exist on the planet. And it's, there's actually a, a Talmudic passage in the tractate of, called Nidarim, Oaths, on page 8b. Amar Reish Lakish. Reish Lakish is the archetypal Baal Tshuva. He's, uh, he was a thief. And he was the, the head of the Jewish mafia in his days. And he met Rabbi Yochanan, and Rabbi Yochanan was so beautiful that he really couldn't believe his eyes. And Rabbi Yochanan said, if you get straight, I'll let you marry my sister. Because, you know, he saw that Reish Lakish was an incredible man. But he was using his powers, he was using his brilliance to do the wrong thing. The Baal Shem Tov very often found people like this the thieves, and he would bring them together and make a minion. And he'd say, okay, guys, we got to daven now and break the locks up in heaven. And only you know how to do it. Right? It's using this, it's, it's using, see, we have these incredible powers, but they can be diverted and misused, or we can reclaim them and now use them for something else. The Baal Shem Tov said in Psalm 136, Osei gedodot, Osei gedodot, Osei gedodot, I praise the one who does incredible wonders alone, behind the scenes, for his loving kindness to the world is hidden. The levado, he does it alone. God works alone. He works behind the scenes. No fanfare. He doesn't really know what he's doing. He doesn't know, we don't really know what he's doing. He doesn't advertise. I was just saying the other day, we're traveling a thousand miles an hour in a spin, right? We're spinning a thousand miles an hour right now, counterclockwise, counterclockwise. <laughs> and we're moving around the sun 
clockwise. <laughs> and we don't feel a thing, right? That's amazing. It's like God works in a way that it's normal. You're just sitting here, there's nothing happening, there's nothing special about this place. Right? It's an illusion that's created specifically in order to give us the total free will that we need. That this earth plane was designed for, to give us total free will, and then to discover the hide and seek God in the midst of our own lives. So essentially what I'm saying, I don't have to go through the whole story, but you'll forgive me if I'll finish till the sixth day, is that, is talking about how God hides and makes a world within which he is here just as much as he's in heaven, but he's hidden. It's the greatest feat for an infinite God to hide. There's no tree to hide again, to hide behind, right? Where are you gonna hide? There's nothing that can hide you. He's hiding right next to us. He's right here. There's nothing else but God. We are in God. We are in God. The big surprise when I say usually is like this. Lech lecha was said to Abraham. I go like, Lech lecha, go to yourself. Abraham, go to yourself. Leave, leave here, leave heaven. He's talking to the soul. Leave heaven. I want you to go to yourself. I want you to go through this whole journey, this soul, sojourn of the soul, and come back. And when you come back, you'll finally understand who you really are. You can't know who you are in heaven. I have to send you away. There are tens of parables about the king who sent his son away. We are that son. We are that child. But there'll be two surprises at the end. One is that I was with you the whole time. You remember that scene on the beach where there's one pair of footprints? Well, where were you, God? I could have used you. What's his answer? I was carrying you. Those are my footprints. So that's the first surprise. I was with you the whole time. You just didn't know it. And secondly, you never left. I had to make it seem like you left. So, and there's more about that type of thing also. The Baal Shem Tov was amazing about these type of things. And the Ari, and all these amazing people who were so-called Kabbalists. But they were more than Kabbalists. In fact, I would not overuse the word Kabbalist, which is in Hebrew, mikubal, a receiver. A receiver transmitter. And as Rabbi Sanders said, it also means parallel. As above, so below. That what we do down here has an effect above. And what is going on above has an effect within the inner, the inner sanctum of our soul. So, mikubal, to, to be a mikubal, I happen to know one, and I would never call myself one because I know how far away I am from it. I do learn, and I love learning it, and I love being it. But let's be careful with the, the terminology we use about what we call people. Let's try and be the best human beings we can be, and learn the most amazing knowledge that we can, and be growth-oriented, in our relationships, and with ourselves, and with our parents, and our children, and to get over the dysfunctionality of society, and to rise up, and to really be a light to the world. That's what it's all about. And in a way, this helps, because what I'm trying to say is that the symmetry here is awesome. We got down, and it shows us there's a step-down ladder to get to the level where even the Garden of Eden, which is high above where we are, the Garden of Eden was a light, shining world. Sefer Yetzirah is Olama Yetzirah. Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden, is the world of Yetzirah. There wasn't even a physical tree there. It wasn't physical. But relative to that which came before it, right? It was just, just enough. That you, and, and actually, we believe, we have stories, we have traditions, and we also have modern stories of people who have had near-death experiences in Israel. They're not translated into English. If I have time, I will. But um, in heaven, when, you, when people have gone up, they've seen relatives. Everybody looks exactly there like they look down here. Wow, how does that happen? The soul has a certain garment that it dresses in, in the lower Garden of Eden. And we look like, we actually, the, the way we look down here is very significant. It's not by chance. We actually look like this above. And when the person goes up, it shouldn't have to happen that people get hurt, you know, and have near-death experiences. But to know that there's another dimension above us, and that when we visit there, there are familiar faces, and they're very loving, and they know everything about us. 
I want you to know that. One description is an amazing hall with no walls in sight. A huge, vast hall with all the people there who were welcoming him. And he heard a voice and he saw a light. And it knew everything about him. And he told him things. And he completely was standing there naked. But it was beautiful. And when he came back, his whole <coughs> life changed. As you know from all of Raymond Moody's books and all of Catherine's books, your life changes. One of the most important things in life when you've come back to life after having died, knowledge and love. To love human beings, to care for other people, to get over the dysfunctionality of society, to rise up above the, the, the crassness, and to be really who we are, and also knowledge, to learn. And they feed each other. We need knowledge, but not just head knowledge. The tough, the stuff, excuse me, but the stuff that I'm trying to share with you, and I appreciate your attention, and I appreciate your being here. I'm not trying to sell anything, but the stuff that I'm trying to share with you, I, I feel that it's not just intellectual knowledge. It's stuff that our souls need to hear, that there is a larger story, and that we are part of it, and that the more we know about it and understand it, the more we can make a difference. Because that's the test at this time, in my humble opinion, is can any of us make a difference? Can many of us make a difference? It seems, according to the way the world is running now, that we can't make any difference. That's not true. It's very important to overcome that illusion. The leaders of the world are not leading the world. They are not the leaders of the world. The peoples of the world are just about, are in our, in our time, are coming to realizations because heaven is interacting in a very, very accelerated rate right now. Heaven is bringing consciousness down to this planet. According to one theory, which is not just a theory, but I'll call it that for the moment, those who went up during the Holocaust, they went up and became very, very exalted in heaven as a result of dying in the Holocaust and as a result of them sacrificing their lives. Because we actually told before we're born what it's going to be like and we accept it upon ourselves and then we forget. You ever heard such things, right? We forget, but we were told. We were told. The people who have been killed in bus bombings were told beforehand and they accepted it. How's that happen? You know, there's free will. How do you know you're going to be a bus bombing? Somebody's going to, somebody's going to do homicide on thousands, hundreds of people, God forbid. Well, heaven knows. And if not before one is born, then the night before or the month before. Things are set up in heaven beforehand. Even though it seems like tragedy down here, it's part of an unfolding process to bring the planet Earth to a higher level. Judaism has a lot to say about this. Christianity has a lot to say. Buddhism has a lot to say. Hinduism has a lot to say. But most of what Judaism has to say is completely unknown to most people, including most Jews. So the moon is made small, made to go down. The fifth day is two Leviathans. All of this is hinted at in the Torah, in the written Torah, in miniature hints, it's, and, and developed in the oral Torah, but only again in terms of children's stories. It's left up to us to understand that there's this, this diminishing process here in order to bring about a certain type of reality. So the fifth day is the two Leviathans. One of them was killed, and one was pickled. I call it the, the source for pickled herring. <laughs> <laughs> like, what's going on? What are you talking about? This is real Jewish mythology. Two fish in the sea, and they were so big that if they would have mated with each other, they would have destroyed the whole world. I.e., they would have made it impossible to make a lower dimensionality. What we're doing here is creating a lower dimensionality at every stage. We're taking out some of the light. We're preventing the light of the sun from shining into the moon. We're encasing the light of the sun in an orb, and we're making the moon go down. The same thing here is that the female is killed, is slain, and the male is castrated in order to prevent the male energy from flowing into the female energy. Again, mythology, but something very deep here. If you know Jung, if you know Carl Jung, there's very deep symbols here, and he appreciated Kabbalah very much, more than most people in our generation do. The depth of the symbolism of Kabbalah, of the Torah system, the crazy rabbis telling their crazy stories, Eat the outer, the outer rind and you'll spit it out. They're not into anything special. They don't know anything. They're just a bunch of legalists who tell weird stories. 
And then the sixth day, I've not done justice to any of them, but you know, I'll just go on and finish here. The sixth day, the two trees. Here was the two fish. Here was the two sun and the moon. Here with the fruits and the, and the, and the trees, it's like a little bit not, you can't see. It's like the fruit and the shell. Here up here again is the two appearing again, the two which is the upper waters and the lower waters, and of course here the, di the light and the darkness. So there's definitely some kind of a male-female light-dark thing here. The female, as we were speaking in one of the classes that we had in Boulder, the female is called the concept of exile, where the female is put into the lower realm called the Shechina. And then all of creation is in exile with her. The souls and the souls in the world are all separate from God. But the, the whole story now is the return of the Shekhinah back up, right? And then as I said, the surprise it was never was two, it was always one, but it has it seemed like it was a dualistic world. But the female goes down in order to, to retrieve her children. In order to in order to to, to to be the godly light within the world, right? On Shabbos we say, Lecha Dodi. We say, Shomo Vezohor Beduri Bidibur Echad. The commandment of Shabbat, to, 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 preserve the, to preserve the Shabbat and to remember the Shabbat. It was, it was said in one word, Hishmi Anu Elam Yuchad. The one God, let us hear it. Adonai Echad, Ushemo Echad. God in heaven, and God on earth, the divine, the supernatural level of divine providence, and the earthly, the hidden, the subtle level, it's all one. It has to seem like it's two. It was in order to create a certain type of reality here that this whole thing was put into operation. And as I said, then we go into history, and we're promised that we're going to get back everything we lost along the way. But this time, as we go back, the return journey will be joyous. We'll get back the two tablets of the covenant that were smashed on Sinai. We'll get back prophecy that was in the first temple. We'll get back the tree of life that was in the Garden of Eden. We'll get back the Leviathans. The Talmud says an amazing story about how the Leviathan will be part of the food of the Last Supper. There's a scene in the stadium after the resurrection of the dead. The resurrection of the dead and King David is sitting at the head of the table in the middle of the stadium with all who have been risen from the dead. And they don't rise up in ghostly bodies, they rise up in light bodies. This is very important to know. The light body, the fluorescent light body, the body, the angelic body of the resurrection of the dead. When we'll rise up in a world where it will be a higher reality. Actually, they say that the resurrection will take place in stages. There will be still people living a normal existence, and there will be people walking around in their light bodies. I'm waiting for that day. I want to meet Adam and Eve. I want to meet Abraham and Sarah. I want to meet all of the great ones who live. We are actually sparks of their souls. But we exist independently of them at the same time as if we're part of their souls. So we'll see them rise in the resurrection. These are, these are ideas that are part of the Midrashic level and the Kabbalistic level of Judaism. The yearning for the day when the, work, when the earth plane will start to be lifted up above its, pleasant, its present level will certainly be the end of war. But much more than that, it will be the beginning of our trek back into eternity back up to the infinite one, a never-ending trick. So we'll receive back the tree of life, which is also awesome in and of itself, and the two leviathans. And as I was saying, the scene there that's described is that there'll be a great leviathan, which is more like a dragon with this kind of a tail, in terms of the mythology involved, and there'll be a great animal, a great shor habar, the wild ox. It's called in Hebrew behemot. Even though it's a plural, it's a behemoth, it's an animal, it has, it's made up of many animals. And so you have the word behemoth, right, that Hobbes wrote about. So this, this scene is going to set up where the Leviathan is going to fight the behemoth. The Leviathan is a sea creature. The rabbis say that it can swim from the lower waters to the upper waters in a split second and back. It's an inside level. The other one, the behema, the animal, lives on its element. The Leviathan lives within its element. So the Alter Rebbe, the first Rebbe of Chabad, says there represent two types of two types of tzaddikim, two types of righteous individuals, two types of service. One is the Shimon Bar Yochai type, lives within the cave and does all of the 
the incredible rectifications of the Torah without any physical accoutrements to fulfill them with. But he does it all on the inside level, the meditator, <laughs> the meditator, right? The meditator who attains interdimensional reality, who is connected to heaven consciously. But on the other hand, there's the other type of Jew, the other type of Sadiq who lives on his element and who's totally grounded in the physical. And so they're going to have a fight to the end. And as the, as the ox gores the Leviathan, the Leviathan with its last breath will swipe its tail across the, the neck of the ox and they'll both fall dead. Then King David will make Kiddush on the wine of the six days of creation. It's called the Anavi, the Yaida Mishumab Anavav Misheshit Mebrishi, the wine that is preserved in its grapes from the six days of creation. It's a concept, but it means that we'll be drinking something that will revive our memory of who we are, the wine from the Garden of Eden. And then he'll make hamotzi on the mana. And then they'll have a little fish from the Leviathan. <laughs> but there'll be so much meat from the Leviathan that everybody will have some, and there'll be so much more left over. That it's, right, it's totally mythological. That they'll give it out into the shvakim, into the marketplaces of Jerusalem, and it'll go out to the whole world. They already had an international market system envisioned an international market system. Just give it out into the marketplace, and it'll go to the whole world. Everybody will eat of the flesh of the Leviathan. And the skin, they'll make a sucker, okay? But there'll be so much skin left that they'll roll the skin around the walls of Jerusalem. And the skin will shine from one end of the world to the other. And as the verse in Isaiah says, Kings will, nations will walk in your light, and kings in the dawn, in the, in the radiance of your dawn. That's the verse that the Talmud brings and the Midrash about the skin of the Leviathan turning into light. Because if you know, the ancient formulization for E equals MC squared is the Hebrew or equals or equals or. Or is with an Aleph is light. And or with an ein is skin, also called hide. And then, so the, the, the coalescence of energy into matter is encoded in the Hebrew or, light, becoming or, skin. And the transformation now, according to the great rabbis, one rabbi said, if I had only lived to hear this midrash about the transformation of the skin of the Leviathan back into a state of light, it would have been enough, because he understood from here the entire physics, the entire cosmology that the rabbis lived with. The prophetic understanding that this world is a coalescence from a high energy state into a physical state, and that eventually this lower physical state will give way and will return to the higher energy state. We'll get back the full sun and the full moon. There's a verse in Isaiah that says, Oh, by the way, the, the, the rabbis say that this meal, that's why I call it the Last Supper, is the transition meal into the next world. In other words, really, as we eat this, at these, with these, eat this food, literally and figuratively, we will transition into the next level of, cre of reality above this world as we know it. It's very exciting. They envisioned how the world would unfold. And they didn't have physics language to, to tell it to us with, so they put it in children's stories about leviathans and behemoths, right? But, it's, but you go deeper and you see there's so much to learn here. And of course, this, the verse in Isaiah says, Ve'haya or ha ki or hama, and it will be, the day will come when the light of the moon will be like the light of the sun, right? We're looking at a, at a vision of transformation here. And it's for us to know that it's very important. So that balances off the diminishing of the moon and also that the the orachama yeshivatayim ki or shivatim bereshit, and this is a continuation of the same verse in Isaiah 20. Not, I'm not sure. A continuation of the same verse, and the light of the sun will be seven times what it was at the time of Genesis, which means it will be taken out of its sheath. So again, the 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 the, the flow downwards into a lower dimension and the trip back, and it depends on us 
to begin to see through it now, knowing this incredible symmetry that it came down and it's going to go back up, right? And eventually reveal the very light itself that was re shining before creation, that was first in God's thought, and it was really preserved, right? And even that will then be seen as a sub-cycle within a greater cycle and within greater cycles. There's an infinite God here who loves us, who put us down here for a reason. So basically, this is that our, I call it Torah evolution. Our souls were here at every, at every stage. We were the molecules in the Big Bang, right? We were the water molecules. We were the, we were the fruits on the trees, right? We were there at every stage. And then we became human. In terms of the teaching of Kabbalah about reincarnation, it is a retrograde to be animal after becoming human, <coughs> as you can understand. But we were animal on the way up to human. We've been everything. Remember the story of the sword and the stone by White? He was training, Merlin was training Arthur to become king. He took Arthur over one night and he said, you see those ants there? Said, yeah. He said, well, we're going to become ants tonight. I want you to learn something. And the next night, fish. And the next night, birds. You ha in order to be king, you have to go and learn what it was like to be every one of these stages. And the way the Midrash says it is that God got all of creation together and said, I want each one of you to give something of yourselves to man. Each one of you is a separate, distinct entity, but man is a complex, complete, excuse me, a... <clears throat> don't have the word. A complex entity. Composite. Composite entity. He will have aspects of all of you. That's why we contain the entire history of the universe inside of our bodies. Not only of, the, of our genealogy, not only of the history of mankind, but the history of the planet and the history of the cosmos. Right? So we don't know that. We walk around like, you know, we can do with this body anything we want. But this is a holy body. This is a temple. A temple for the soul. It was important to give you somewhat of, a, of what I call the visions of the past, right? So go back a little bit to see where it all came from and somewhat of the, the, the larger picture. I want to... Page 8 in the songbooks, page 8 in the songbooks is the same tune that we sang before but to the words Adon Olam. I think you'll agree with me, it's an amazing union, amazing combination. This, when you're ready, just give me the sign and we'll start singing Adon Olam to a tune that we've sang before, but you're in for a surprise. So, you know, this, the prayer service in a lot of synagogues has become a little bit inhibited. You know, maybe there's a little singing once in a while and, and, the, and the, the prayer leader is able to maybe be a little emotional, but usually you won't find this. So us Jews, we Jews, we have to get a little bit less inhibited. Don't worry about who's sitting next to you and what they're going to think. Be happy and cry. You know, my joke is there are two kinds of people in the world. There are people who are happy when they're happy. Excuse me, people who are, who are, who are, um, who are happy when they're happy and people who cry when they're happy. The people who are happy when they're happy look at the people who cry when they're happy and say, you don't know how to, and say, why are you crying? The people who are happy when they're happy look at the people who are not happy, who are the people who are crying when they're happy and say, why are you crying? And the people who are crying when they're happy look at the people who are happy when they're happy and say, you don't know what it is to be happy. So I bless us all, we should cry with happiness. But crying and being happy are, my, are really are very connected. So let's try it with this song. Let's be very happy. I don't know Hashem I 
of the future. I mean, I talked about it a little bit, and I don't want to overdo it. I don't want to... I don't want to uh, there's so many things to talk about. I try to throw in a little bit of what I... you know, messages that come to me while I'm talking. Messages of how important it is to, to know that there is a God, that He really cares for us, that if this is all taking place within God, that's quite amazing. Right? And He wants us to know that, internalize that. He wants us to go up to know the highest truths and to bring those truths down into our hearts and into our actions. The big question is, can we make a difference? So this is the second, the second diagram. There are very simple diagrams, obviously. The first one is the six days of creation and all that. This is, the verse here is from, not, from, from, from the Psalms. For a thousand years in your eyes are like a day gone by. Yeah. It's a simple picture, but it's worth it. No accidents. <laughs> okay, very good. This, of course, this of course is a 24-hour clock, so it's coming up till six o'clock. But that's beautiful. <laughs> okay. So a thousand years in your eyes, or as a day gone by. We learn from this in the Talmud that the six days of creation are a template for what will be six thousand years. The Ramban, Rabbi the Nachmanides, actually does a very special um, uh, correlation between things that happen on each day of creation and the things that happen parallel to those things in the thousand year periods, the millennia that took place subsequent to Adam. Well, we began the sixth millennium in the year 1240, which was the Hebrew year 5000. As you know, when you're five years old, the day of your fifth birthday, you enter into which year? Your sixth year. It's the beginning of your sixth year. So the beginning of the 5,000 was the beginning of the sixth millennium. It corresponds to the year 1240. And there was really an amazing transition, and certainly and especially in the history of Kabbalah. Before the beginning of the sixth millennium, it was absolutely forbidden forbidden to speak Kabbalah in public. We have a letter from one of the great rabbis of the time, Rabbi Isaac the Blind, 
who writes specifically to his students, do not write your ideas, do not share them with the wrong people. This is very precious, and if you go and you go give it to the wrong place, it'll just backfire against us and it'll come against us and you don't know what's going on. It, it just so happens that at that time, the Christian Kabbalah was rising. So he maybe wanted to protect the Jewish ideas. I mean, they were translating texts from Hebrew into Latin, the Kabbalistic texts, Shari Ora, and a few others around this time. This is the time that Rabbi Abraham Abulafia was born. The Ramban himself was functioning, was flourishing here, and his students. This is a time of the, of the, that the Ramban himself himself said that since the sixth day of creation represents a movement, a movement into, the, into the domain of the human, right? Everything bef before this and the simple level of the Torah is the creation of everything else that leads up to man, but man is the crown of creation. We don't look like it right now, but we're supposed to be, and we, right? We have that job here. So the sixth, moving into the sixth millennium, it became clear in all of the texts that were produced at that time that it was just an open field relative to what had been before. In the year 1270, 30 years after this, the Zohar was unearthed in Spain. Uh, we believe, as you can read in Rabbi Kaplan's meditation in Kabbalah, Rabbi Kaplan was an amazing man. He bridged the, the incredible abyss that separates academia from the traditional view of Kabbalah. And he was, he was beautiful at it. In his Sefer Yitzira, he does it. He shows that to take the academic view of things is, a, is a, an emasculated way of looking at the Torah. It separates Yesod from Malchut. It separates the male principle from the female. It says Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai never existed and never wrote the Zohar. And it says that um, the Rabbi Nechunya ben Hakana didn't write the Bahir, and nobody really wrote anything because academia says that Moses didn't write Moses, Isaiah didn't write Isaiah, Joel didn't write Joel, and Daniel didn't write Daniel. So it really just par for the course that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai didn't write the Zohar. Nobody wrote anything. It was just like, you know, they made it up. So we, we can't go like that. I'm sorry. These are, these are too precious. We have a, a living tradition that tells us that Moses really was there. It's the problem of accepting prophecy. If Isaiah, if Isaiah was one Isaiah, not three, then he prophesied. And we can't admit the existence of prophecy. Right? So that's the limitation of academia. It should be well. <laughs> <laughs> we want a living tradition. At any rate, this, the beginning of the sixth millennium is very exciting. It gets even better around here. It happens, it, of course, it happens in the wake of the Spanish Inquisition, 1490. We're talking about six hours on the cosmic clock. That's what I call it. Six hours on the cosmic clock leads us to, 12, to 1490. Right? We've gone 250 years, which is the equivalent of six hours. Of a thousand years is 24 hours. If you break it down into 250 year periods. You can get down to the, the one, one year on the cosmic clock, and this is what the Goan of Vilna was very much into, is 41 years and eight months. In other words, as we'll see in a minute, it, there are significant, these are significant moments in history. At any rate, up here in 1490, we have another cluster of great masters, great souls who came down. Here, when the Zohar was revealed in 1270, the Zohar talks in tens of places about the specialness of midnight. That the, ten, that the masters of Zohar would get up at midnight, or just before midnight. They even had contraptions with like, uh, is a, there's a story in the Zohar about a contraption that somebody created that would set it off and make a ball roll down and plunk into some water or whatever and wake him up just a minute before midnight. <laughs> at any rate, 12 o'clock, uh, not 12 o'clock exactly, but midnight, Chatzot Laila, is a transition, a very important transition. And so the, the sages, the people that were living at this time, chief among them being the Ari, Rabbi Isaac Luria, even though he wasn't born until 1535, but the cluster effect is an effect here. Rabbi Moshe Cordovero, Rabbi Yosef Karo, the, man, the, the author of the, of the Shulchan Aruch, but he himself had a manifestation, a visitation, of, a, of an angelic being. And it's recorded that they used to see him speaking these incredible words. 
that were committed to writing afterwards in the book which is called Magid Misharim, a book of the teachings of the angelic entity that entered into and spoke through Rabbi Yosef Karo, the great halachic, the, right, the, great, the great halachic master. Because in those days, and as should be this in our days, there should be no separation. The Torah is a holistic teaching. You have to have a soul and a body. You have to have a soul of the Torah, which is the Kabbalah, and the body of the Torah, its mitzvot, and even the garments of the Torah, its stories. And those who see deeper see the body, and those who see deeper, they see the soul. But the body and the clothing are very important. And they don't throw anything away on the way in. It's a moralistic system on the outside, because it says if you do wrong, you have to, you have to suffer the consequences. On the inside, God is very loving. And we know that it even goes to the point that even if somebody has done the worst things in the world, they're still, because essentially they're good, they can come back. You can always come back. The outside is a little bit daunting. The inside is awesome in its receptivity, in its beauty, in its love. But it has to be protected. You can't misuse the inside. You can't say, I'll do anything I want, and God will forgive me. That's not allowed. Right? If you made mistakes, that's one thing. But don't do anything purposely. It's called sinning on purpose, the Shabbatian idea. Right? The Baal Shem Tov said, if you've sinned, get up right away. Don't get depressed. Don't let guilt overcome you, because it'll just lead to further and further. You'll get caught in the spiral, the downward spiral. No, get up and know that whatever happened had to happen. But don't stay there. But don't ever justify. Don't make excuses. Don't legitimize when you do something wrong. Don't make a philosophy out of it. Be straight. Be right. Be good. We can do it. It's important for us and our children. It's 8.45. Anyway, there's this cluster here, masters, and they got up and they got up at midnight. And they knew where they were living at midnight of the sixth millennium, right? The parallel to the sixth day of creation is the sixth millennium and midnight. Here, 1740, 500 years after the beginning, 12 hours later on the cosmic clock, the Baal Shem Tov, the Goan of Vilna, Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lutzato, the Ramcha, the Chida, the Rashash, the Orachaim, names you've heard and names you haven't heard, but all masters of Kabbalah, and they all knew that they were living at the equivalent of dawn of the sixth millennium. And, they, and the Gaon of Vilna, independently from the Baal Shem Tov, both of them independently told their students, go to Israel before 1840. This is 1740. Go to Israel before 1840, because the prophecy in the Zohar is that in 1840, in the year 5600 of the Jewish calendar, the, the wellsprings of wisdom from above and from below will open. We have to be in Israel to catch it. And they did. The students of the Gona Vilna went to Hebron in Jerusalem. The students of the Baal Shem Tov went to Sfat in Tiberia. They went in order to receive the Messianic light in Israel. This is not the history you learn nowadays, but this is a very important. These are the ones who came at great expense, at great danger in those days to come to the land of Israel. <clears throat> I'll skip now to here. 1990, our lifetimes. Where are all the great masters, right? What happened? Where are they all? What's going on? Why is everything so hidden? Certainly 1990 was a, a watershed year, the fall of communism. Right? 12 months, 12 weeks, 12 days, 12 hours, falling one after the other, all communist states. Incredible, in 1990. Saddam Hussein, the Ethiopian Aliyah, the Russian Aliyah, the Lubavitchers, the Rebbe being very knowledgeable about this whole thing. But it became a little bit out of control. They made him into the Messiah. He's coming, he's coming. And right there in January of 1990, he got a stroke. Messianism is very dangerous. I recommend we be mature Messianists. There are our feet on the ground. Know that the Mashiach is a process. There's no dates here. It depends on us, on our ability to see through the illusions 
of this world and to know that God is here in our lives. And it's a lot of work, but it's definitely well worth it. You don't sell Mashiach. You don't sell this. You try and live it. It's a very dangerous thing to try and sell the Mashiach to the Jewish people. It's dangerous because if the date comes and then goes by, our hearts drop, our hearts break. Don't break the Jewish heart. We need hope to be able to go on. We need to know that we're part of a process. I'm very process oriented. So what we have here is we're now coming up in the final inning. We're promised here in this final inning, this 235 years that are left between now and the end of the sixth millennium officially, we're promised that we don't have to go to the very end. That sometime here, there has to be a perfection of the physical world in the form of the third temple in Jerusalem. There'll be a resurrection of the dead in three stages. We're gonna see it in our lifetimes? Oh, do I hope so. And our wanting it is actually part of it. This will be the beginning of the uplifting of the planet, right? We don't see it now. It seems to be that right now at this transition stage, there's blocks in front of us that seem to be like the spread of Islam is so strange that after 9-11, Islam should become more and more spreading more strongly and it's hatred, it's insightfulness, God forbid. Islam has to be brought up to its mature level. We have to be a part in that. I don't know how exactly. I do speak to Arabs very often, and my friends, my students themselves, are part of, 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 of are, are going and speaking to the Sufis in Israel, in the conclaves of the Arabs themselves, who want peace, who are overcome by the Hamas, but who are trying their best to, to ward off, and we honor them, and we're connected with them, but there's a lot of work they have to do. They're really low on the scale of, of maturity in terms of social maturity. Then they project, when they see something as evil, I'm sorry to say this, they see something as evil, they identify the evil with the person. They want to kill America and they want to kill Israel. It's much more subtle what evil is. The good in a person, see the good in somebody. Okay, fine, if they're making a mistake, don't kill them for it. It's totally, it's totally a cancer at this point. It's a very dangerous game. Why did God give us such a difficult situation as we're coming back to the land of Israel? It has to, be with this, it has to do with the secret of the sixth hour. But, uh, but the, 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 the essence being that as we get closer to the Messianic age, the blocks, the barricades, the obstacles in front of us are stronger. But it's actually a sign that we're closer. It's a hard one. It's a hard one. I bring this to you and I show this to you and I hold it up like this just in order to to give you uh, that extra little push to know that it's really real. I, I think what I, what I want to say is like this. Our mothers and our fathers and our grandparents all the way back for thousands of years have been lighting Shabbat candles. When do we light Shabbat candles? Either 18 minutes or in Jerusalem, 40 minutes before sundown. And it's not a philosophy, it's an action. We do it. But what's behind the action? What's behind the action of receiving Shabbos early? A, what's called Tosevet Shabbos Kodesh, additional holiness of Shabbos, of bringing Shabbos into the world a little bit early, of going like this with the light and closing your eyes and covering your face. And at that moment, unless you make a condition, unless you make a condition, it is Shabbos for you. What does that mean on the millennial scale? That little action that we do every week, that our mothers and our grandmothers and you ladies are doing, what does it mean on the millennial scale? It means that Shabbos is gonna come in early in the merit of thousands of years of lighting candles early. That we won't have to go through all of the, the disasters that could happen. There's very different messianic scenarios. How they'll unfold depends on us. The Jewish people now are largely asleep. I'll tell you one thing as we end now about the body of history. We're in the feet. I call us the souls of the feet. <laughs> We've been here every time at every stage along the way. And the lower part of us always comes down. Less consciousness, less ability to know who we are, and more of us. It's a bifurcating system. The souls at the top were the great souls, and then we get further and further down until we come down to here.
So it's fitting that I share a beautiful little parable with you about this, and it'll, hopefully it'll help me to tie in everything, and we won't have to rush to the end. Uh, this thing of a body, this is just really a, just an uh, acupun uh, acupuncture chart, but it's very useful for me, as there's many, many different points on the human body. We say that the soul from Adam until Jacob are from the head of this body. And in the neck is the souls that went down, Jacob's children that went down into Egypt, which corresponds to the neck of history. Then we came out into the desert, the Exodus, and came out into the torso. We came into the land of Israel. We built the temple. And we were at the, the solar plexus. Forgive me those of you who have heard this before on the weekend. Then we went down for 100, 420 years and we went into the exile of Babylon, which is called the intestines of the world. And then we came back and we built the second temple, which corresponds to the genital area. The first one is called Tiferet. The second one was called Yesod. The Sphero, Tiferet, and Yesod, the two temples. And then we went into 2,000 years of exile. The souls that were born at every stage along the way were us. But each time we came back, we got split into more pieces. The higher back up we go, the more unified we are. The lower down we go, the more there are many of us. The test of our time is to know our oneness, our unity, despite the differences down here in the physical plane. It's to connect with each other on the higher levels. That's what going to shul is about. That's what learning Torah is about, is when we connect on the soul level and we really know how, we, it's like, I always say, it's like going into, 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 into the synagogue is like going back to kindergarten, like a, what do you call it, a, um, a reunion, a class reunion of kindergarten, right? And like now all of us are presidents of this and that. We all have these things. We're all individuated and everything. Well, let's go back to our connection to back then, like when we were all connected back up in the higher levels, when we hadn't become who we are yet. And now to connect consciously to who we are on that higher level and then to bring that incredible power of the collective soul back down into our individual lives. It's a very exciting process, the way I see it. At any rate, as we come down here, we're in the feet. So the parable about this is very beautiful. And I'll end with this and then any questions in the overflow of time. There was a great teacher in Jerusalem named Rabbi Salman Mutsafi. As I said the other day, Salman in Baghdad was the equivalent of Zalman in Europe. <coughs> Salman Mutsafi. He was a student of the Ben Ishchai in Baghdad. He told many parables. One of them went something like this. Once upon a time, a train load of sugar was winding its way from Haifa to Jerusalem. Right? The dock in Haifa, the train load. The sugar had been shipped to Israel in large sacks, and the sugar company's dock workers had stacked them high in open cars at the dock. Car after car was loaded, and the train was finally ready to make its way to Jerusalem. As the train began its long climb up into the Judean mountains, on its way to the station in Jerusalem, something went wrong. The train derailed, and carload after carload of sugar toppled over into a deep valley. Many of a wadi, right? It's called wadi. Many of the sacks broke open. Sugar lay strewn all over. Okay. In an attempt to recover some of the sugar, the company hired a fleet of tractors. Since the sugar was piled so high in certain locations, the tractor drivers were successful in salvaging large amounts of pure white sugar without the slightest trace of dirt or impurities. That was the condition. We don't want any dirty sugar. So they were very careful. Next, the company sent out very strong men with big barrels and shovels. Their instructions were to shovel as much sugar as they could on the condition that it would be completely free of any impurities. Though these big men brought back much less sugar than the tractor drivers who preceded them, they were paid a very, the same salary as the tractor drivers because they exerted the same amount of energy. This is a, is a kind of a balance of the generations. Even as the generations get lower and lower, but the work gets harder and harder, and you have to work with what you're given and so you're given the same reward as those who came before you. Next, the company sent out smaller people and finally children with small pails. Now the going was rough, 
And some children had to travel great distances down into the valley in order to bring back clean sugar. For this reason, the company felt justified in paying each child who brought back a pail of sugar the same as the tractor drivers and the giants. Finally, almost all of the sugar had been returned. It was a great miracle. Yet, if you would bend down and peer into the valley, you could see a thin sheet of sugar still stretching for as far as the eye could see in many directions. The company had been training a group of ants <laughs> for some time, trying to produce a non-sugar-eating ant. <laughs> to their chagrin, all their experiments ended up in failure. Now, however, they had all these ants who loved sugar. They realized that this was a real stroke of luck and agreed that in order to salvage the remaining sugar, the ants were the only logical solution. They told the ants before taking off that they'd be handsomely rewarded, but they were warned not to go off with any of the sugar and hard it for their own use. The ants agreed. Eventually, every grain of sugar was returned, and the company was very happy. Without the ants, a tremendous amount of sugar would have been lost, God forbid. Now, wasn't it worth it just for that? <laughs> this parable, which I have been embellished only slightly, is about the different levels of souls who have lived in this world since the time of Adam. In former generations, great individuals lived who could retrieve and rectify the fallen souls and sparks of holiness that God had purposely strewn down into the depths of this world. You see, that process we went down, the fall of space, time, and consciousness, we were there at every stage, right? Sparks of holiness being strewn down into the lower worlds, and eventually to become conscious and to do the return trip. You know, it's a very big thing with Abraham and Sarah that they converted converts. They brought souls. They made souls. It says, the yas. Abraham and Sarah made souls, so the Midrash says, you can't make a soul. Um, no, I don't have it here. Okay. But um, it, it means that they converted converts. It means that they saw souls having come from Adam, the fallen souls that came from Adam, and their job was to bring them back, right? Everybody they saw, everybody, every human being is a soul that came from Adam. And so our job is to bring us all back together. We have a teaching that all mankind will become Israel. We don't have to force everybody to become Israel. It's a privilege to be Israel. The Jewish people will be lifted up to be Israel, and all of mankind will be lifted up to be Israel. We're not even Israel yet. We're trying to be. We, we have the potential to be. But Israel is a much higher concept than Yehudi, than Jew. And then we have a concept in the Ibn Ezra that says that all of the Jews will become Kohanim, the priests of mankind, and all of mankind will become Israel. All of the, all of the world will become the land of Israel. That is to say, the, the, the level of degree or whole of holiness of the world will re it up and will become the land of Israel, and all of Israel will become Jerusalem. It will be the lifting up of space and time and soul, all of mankind being lifted up, all of space being lifted up, and all of time being lifted up into the seventh millennium and the eighth millennium. This is after the fall of consciousness and space-time. There will be the rise of space-time and consciousness, but it really depends on us, because consciousness is the key. So the reason this parable fits in so beautifully is, it will come clear in a second. These original souls that were born, the Adams and the Eves and the Abrahams and the Sarahs, they were born with tremendous spiritual powers and they worked hard to bring the entire creation to its final rectification. They worked hard to bring the entire creation to its final rectification, to fix the sin of Adam, which caused the falling of the sparks and the souls into the lower dimensionality. They saw this and they saw and they understood that their job was to bring mankind back to bring God back into the world, to bring God back into the consciousness of mankind by being, by embodying godliness, and thereby by drawing the sparks and souls that would split, what is a spark in a soul? A, a soul splits up into sparks. It's just a relationship that the soul is a 
larger entity, and a spark is a soul also, but it's a spark of a larger soul. And that larger soul is a spark of a larger soul also. But that's the relationship of sparks and souls. So they wanted to bring the world back to its final rectification. The inner work of bringing the world back to its final rectification, we still have that job, and we can still make a difference. Those inner channels of creation is where we can make a difference. They saw, their, they, their, in a sense, however, their very, very greatness, their very greatness prevented them from becoming too enmeshed in this world. They saw its dangers and concentrated more on salvaging the pure sparks of holiness that were most accessible. Going into the realm of evil to redeem the farthest flung, flung sparks was known to be extremely dangerous. And even the greatest had failed to some extent, like Adam, when attempting to enter this realm. As a result, there was only so much they could do. As time went on, the generations diminished. People found themselves in situations that their ancestors would never have dreamed entering. They took strength, however, and retrieved whatever they could of the pure sparks of holiness that, strain, that lay strewn everywhere. These sparks being located primarily in certain people, souls that had become enmeshed in the realm of evil, but they were really good souls, and they just had to be told, you know, it's really not for you. You've got to come back into who you really are. Right? Come back to who you are. Return to who you are. Return to the land of your soul. Return again. Return again. And although they brought back fewer sparks, but they were rewarded for their efforts. Finally, we come to the lowest souls on the totem pole. It is these ant souls that are given the job of retrieving the final sparks. Their job is doubly difficult. They have much less going for them than, than their ancestors, and the sparks they must retrieve are much more deeply sunk in the abyss than those which their ancestors were able to bring back in such quantities. But that's why whatever we do, even the smallest move towards Kedusha, towards holiness, towards perfecting ourselves in the light of God, towards aligning ourselves with the higher will, even the slightest move is tremendous because the block in front of us is that great. And we're the ant souls. And we have an incredible job in front of us. And we're doing it. We just don't know. Now we want to become conscious and do it. I just wanted to tell you, to give you a new perception, or to, inc to increase or to empower you more with the perception that we are souls, that we've been sent here, that it's not a dream that somebody dreamed up. It really is true. And that, that we've been put in these amazing bodies and we have this amazing job to do. We are Clark Kent's. And we go into our shuls and we become Superman. But we don't really believe it yet, right? Superman, you know, we can't fly. But the power is there and it's waiting to be expressed. And really it involves, it involves us coming together in a more real way and, and dropping the masks more and being less inhibited about who we really are the pain that we have, let's be real about it. We're suffering, a lot of us, and we need each other's help. We need healing, and that comes from the love of the other. The laws of mourning here are, are instructive, that when somebody is in mourning, we go and we sit with them, and we be with them in their pain. And only then, maybe after a while, that love, that healing can take effect. But you don't talk, you don't, you don't talk about superficialities and trivialities. You have to be together. So let's learn, God willing, to be more with each other, to appreciate that process. Um, I thank you so much for letting me be here. I, I feel I didn't really um, do justice to the subject. That's kind of a feeling that I have inside. But um, let's, let's just ask, please Hashem, give us a chance. We want to serve you. It's a special time. It's almost Shabbos. The world is accelerating. We've been brought down here. There's six billion of us. Six billion of us. The time is coming when all of us want to come together. Give us, a, give us some openings that we can see our way in Israel and in the world. That world Jewry can come to its true light. That we can bond with our, our brothers and our sisters in a true way. That Christians, evangelists, etc., will bond with us, but not with their agenda, but because they truly believe that Israel is the chosen and the pupil of God's eye. And when you truly believe that Israel is the pupil of God's eye, then we will also begin to believe it about ourselves. Because right now it's very hard for us. I don't see like we're, we're not these things that special. On the contrary, everybody blames us for all the problems in the world. So Hashem, please, we need your help. That's like number one. And we want to call on you. And we want to know that you're there when we call on you. And when we sing, 
please be with us. When we talk your Torah, when we do your mitzvot, don't let it be by rote. Don't let it be meaningless. The, the system that you gave us was to bring meaning to man's existence, to bring meaning to thought, to speech, and to action. And when we do brachas and learn your Torah, but without the awareness and the consciousness of what it is, we become part of the problem instead of part of the solution. Enough. Give us a chance. Please infuse us with your will. Infuse us with your being. We need it so much. Our children need it. We need to be real examples of what it is to be Israel.